All right, let's talk about you. The solid red lines are where the urban center stops because of geography. The dotted are where the cost of expansion goes up. Check out you guys in the middle. I mean, yes, you've got like a protected wetland right there, but honestly, it's so small you can go around it. One of the big things to keep in mind if your intent is to change the economic destiny of your locality is you know, taking an accurate stock of your assets and your liabilities and taking a really good hard look at your local geography and your regional geography. And in your case, there are no real limits to where you can go. You've got some of the cheapest land in the country, you've got access to a river, but there are a couple of problems. The first one, the most significant one, is you're close to New Orleans. And that's not because everyone's gonna go party there on a Thursday, no, 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 no. The problem is, is New Orleans is the world's largest bulk export terminal. And so anything that was in about 600 miles of it, the decision has been made over and over and over and over to just not move up the value added chain. Produce a raw commodity, ship it to New Orleans, they send it over the horizon and that's the end of the story. It's cheap, it's easy, it's boring, and it limits what you can do. Now I wanna compare a few other zones that I've worked with at the po in the past just to give you an idea. So this is the Pacific Northwest, specifically Portland and Seattle. And you'll notice that there's not a lot that they can do to expand, especially Seattle. Seattle's on an isthmus. As a result, land prices are ridiculous. And if everyone has a million dollar efficiency condo, because that's the low end in the market, then if you have 1% spare capital, that adds up to a lot of cash real quick. So the Pacific Northwest has got to go not just up the manufacturing scale because most manufacturing just isn't viable in that market. They've gotten into IT in a very big way. This probably isn't the model for you. I mean, does everyone you know just have a spare $100,000 lying around? Because that's what it takes. I will never tell urban centers to not go into STEM and not try to do stuff with tech, but if you want to do it at scale, I just don't think you have the capital structure for it because your land is simply too affordable. They went into tech not because they wanted to, but because they had no choice. There was nothing else they could try. Charleston, very similar to the PNW in terms of its inability to expand. They basically live between two rivers. And so they have struck on a double strategy. Number one, they've come up with a really creative way to train their workforce. When they find an investor, they ask what specific jobs need to be filled. And then they work with the state of South Carolina to train up a half a dozen people for each theoretical position. And then they allow the would-be investor to interview them. And if they hire anyone from their pool, the government gets paid a fee to compensate for the cost of the training and the company gets a ready-made workforce. That's part one. Part two is they convince somebody else to pay for it all. They can do that because they can draw from the populations in upstate, or excuse me, they don't call it upstate, they're in state South Carolina, and they're an ocean port. Why is the ocean port important? Because of what is arguably the dumbest law we have in the United States today. The Jones Act was passed during the Great Depression. The idea was to protect American positions in maritime commerce. And it says that no cargo can be transported between any two American ports unless the ship carrying the cargo is American built, owned, captained, and crewed. As a result, shipments between American ports has dropped by 99% in value over the last century. And one of the reasons you guys do not see ships on the Red River every single minute is because of that law. But foreign ships that come to a port are exempt, so they all go to New Orleans. Any American port on a river has basically been gutted because of this law. So I've been fighting this very lonely one-man war against this stupid law for so long. Uh, I honestly think the Jones Act is the single biggest problem facing American development moving forward. And it's certainly a big issue for you. 
because it means you can't follow the Charleston model because ocean-going vessels can't get this far. You need to have an American ship. And before you think, well, I like the idea of American ships, can you imagine if we did this for any other mode of cargo? Air, that would remove 30% to 50% of the planes in the air. Truck, that would remove 80% of them. Train, over half. We only do this for our most efficient method of transport. That is the very definition of idiocy from my point of view. So yeah, talk to your senator to get rid of that. In the meantime, it's important to understand that you shouldn't trust Texas. <laughs> Folks, that's 15 million people with a lot of space to expand. And they're slowly metabolizing all the land that's between the four triangle cities. And even with that, the reindustrialization of North America has been going so far. I mean, this isn't a new thing. We've been industrializing at an ever growing pace for about 10 years now. Without the Chinese and the Germans being on the skids, we probably need to double the size of the industrial plant in the United States within the next five years, assuming we still want stuff. Americans really like stuff. But Texas, you're a minnow, and you're a ways out. Texas is experiencing labor shortages. The two ways where they're dealing with is by having a 0% income tax to attract more folks in, and by reaching out and holding their nose when they do it, and integrating with Oklahoma. Let me underline that. Texas is integrating with Oklahoma on purpose. But OKC and Tulsa have 10 times your population. There's an economy of scale there that you can't match. And if you do manage to integrate yourself into the triangle, you know, it's part of a very dynamic system. It's the fastest growing part of the country. Will be for 30 years. But you're a ways out, and you don't get much of a vote in how it goes. And it wouldn't take much for one suburb of one of these four cities to take what makes you special away, and they'd be a lot closer. It'd be really easy for them to do. So just like with IT, I'm not going to tell you to not go into manufacturing. That would be silly. But you have to have a very realistic approach to what you're going to target. And I think that your geography, combined with the way the global system is changing, provides a lot lower risk, a lot higher value opportunities for you. Start with energy. This is total investment from all government and all private into all oil and all natural gas globally. Now, back in 2014 at the peak, a narrative took hold that fossil fuels are done. Not necessarily for directly environmental reasons, but the idea was that it takes three to eight years to bring a conventional field online, and then another five to 15 years for that investment to break even. Well, if you're thinking that we need to be a, to a carbon neutral environment by 2040, we're already past the time window for the investment. So why would you put your money into a project that will never pay you back? Now, I can find a freight train of logical disconnects in that particular logic chain. But it took hold in all of the world's financial centers, and among other things, we got ESG out of that. Three to eight years for a break even. Stick with that. Now, luckily, what is true for the average is not true for each individual piece. I like to call this the checkbook map, because every dot up there is someone who paid their power bill. Here are the world's conventional oil and natural gas basins. In one snapshot, this is globalization, the agony of globalization, getting the energy from where it's produced to where we actually use it. And this is where the world's commercially viable shale deposits are. There are 20 odd reasons why American energy is fundamentally different compared to the energy complex of every other country. But considering the environment we're in today, this is by far the most important. Here, only here, we produce it where we live. This is the upper Midwest. Has anyone ever done anything over, other than fly over the Midwest here? Okay. 
That there is Marshalltown, Iowa, where I'm from. <laughs> what the hell is this? That's Western North Dakota, population four and a half. The half is someone flying over. It's lit up not because there's a frat party. It's lit up because of a problem with transport. Oil's a liquid. It conforms to the shape of the container it's in. You can put it into a rail car, a truck, whatever you want. But natural gas disperses. You have to have a system to gather it, to transport it, to distribute it, to use it, all at the same pace because storage is very difficult and very expensive. Here in the United States, in the shale patches, so much nat gas is bubbling up out of the oil projects as a byproduct. We have to flare it. You can see the flares from space. It's the same in the Permian. It's the same in the Eagleford. That's a very different price structure. These producers are basically giving the stuff away just to get rid of it. These red arrows, those are hurricanes. You see these blue spikes? That's Henry Hub. Old story, storm comes through the Gulf, they shut down everything, they go out after the storm, repair the damage. That's how it was until 2009, because that is the year in the United States, well, in North America, where shale production produced over half of global demand, I'm sorry, half of regional demand. Every shale well's on shore. The other two lines are the pricing for Chinese and European natural gas. This little spot right here, do we have any Texans here? I should know if I'm making fun of someone before I do it. <laughs> okay, this little spike right here, this is what happened in January of 21 when Texas got cold. Got down to 25 and everything stopped. Oil, natural gas, solar, wind, nuclear. Oh my God, there were snowmen in San Antonio. They were sad snowmen, but they lasted for two weeks. Everyone in Austin just made margaritas. And this right here, this is what we've been dealing with because of the Ukraine war. Back in September, we hit $9 and we lost our minds. $9 in the United States, $9 natural gas. In inflation index terms, that's exactly the 50 year average. We have been bitching about average energy prices. And then you can see what's happening everywhere else. We produce it here. We use it here. We don't import it from a continent away or from a genocidal dictator. We don't have to make an adjustment. And we have a very different pricing structure because of it. This is the new normal, folks. This sort of energy price split between us and the rest of the world. Can you imagine what that does in a competitive globalized environment? Can you imagine what it does in a deglobalizing system where they can't even get it at all? This is as good as it's going to be for the rest of them for a minimum of 20 years. And natural gas and electricity prices here are in the bottom 10% of the United States. If you can't use energy in Greater Shreveport to do something, something is wrong. There are a lot of sectors out there that are energy intensive that are about to fall into global shortage. And I suggest you move into all of them. <laughs> 